You've been over two months and we've seen so much action since you took over the helm of the Philippine Central Bank that that's not only moved financial markets, and uh, but also kept us journalists on the edge of our seats. I remember clearly when we first spoke on the day your appointment was announced, I asked you about your policy outlook. And you told me then that you didn't see the need to rush uh, interest rate hikes. Uh, I guess it just goes to show how quickly the economic yes. environment has changed Yes. Uh, because of soaring inflation, um, the peso was weakened. We just saw the currency uh, hit another record low today. Of course, there is the economic fallout from the war in Ukraine. There's decades high inflation in many countries, including in the United States. That has, of course, prompted the Federal Reserve to embark on what has become the sharpest round of U.S. rate hikes since the 1980s. Of course, the tightening of policy around the world has not only soured sentiment, but it has also stoked recession fears in, in the United States. And that has added to the grim picture, grim economic picture we've seen this week when we saw um, economic activity in China extending its decline last month after, of course, new COVID-19 infections, the worst heat waves in decades and struggles in the property sector. So, so my first question, Governor, against the very challenging backdrop, how do you now plan to steer the Philippine economy towards a sustainable recovery and reach the 8% growth medium target set by the new government of President Marcos? Well, uh, our monetary policy is not really designed for meeting government growth targets. Of course, uh, our main goal, well, our three pillars are, one, price stability, two, financial stability, and three, a safe, stable, and efficient payment system. And clearly, you do not see uh, high, very high economic growth there. By very high, I mean growth rates that are much higher than historical. And obviously, 8% is much higher than historical. Uh, of course, we do hope that the, the lower end of the target, which is not very far from historical, if you want to look only at uh, pre-COVID, the, the 10 years before COVID, uh, it will be nice to be able to hit at least that, uh, that part of the DBCC uh, target. And we think it's still possible. So... Uh, now, you were talking about surprises. The biggest surprise of all was, of course, the, how big and how fast the pivot in U.S. monetary policy uh, was. The way it looks to me, even the, if you're looking at what the Fed people were saying uh, just uh, late last year or even early this year, this was not part of their own scenarios. So if it's surprising the very people who are now making these large uh, policy rate increases, all the more that we who uh, have less inside knowledge of what they're doing will be surprised. Now, fortunately, the Philippines uh, has a sufficient buffer, I think, and also, the, from the point of view of the near term, uh, having zero lockdowns compared to having lockdowns last year will help. Okay, so th that's why we're quite optimistic that uh, the scenario, our scenario is no lockdowns. And even with the headwinds coming from uh, the uh, very high and very fast adjustments in U.S. interest rates, I think the 6.5 percent, which is what is the low end of the government target, is still doable. Okay, Governor. Right. Governor, the, the central bank's next policy meeting is on September 22nd, and I, that, that follows the Fed's meeting where it is expected to deliver a third 75 basis points hike. 
And I know the, the European Central Bank is also gearing up for another big rate hike this month as the Eurozone inflation rose to another record high last month. And the Philippines is also battling uh, soaring inflation, as we saw in the latest central bank's inflation forecast for August, the top end being 6.7%, which is still running at near four-year high. So, Governor, how, how will these expectations of more aggressive rate hikes and high domestic inflation impact your decision this month? Uh, do you still see scope for more aggressive policy moves? Okay, uh, let me first say that uh, we are up to, relative to previous meetings, we are likely to adjust downwards the oil, our oil price assumptions. So that should go for uh, lower inflation. The problem, of course, is that since the price index is already high, even a small month-on-month -month increase will register a large increase re relative to the same month last year. Okay, so that is why uh, the actual, if, even if month-on-month -month inflation normalizes to, let's say, okay, our target, let's say, is uh, 3, so 3 divided by 12. So it, re it normalizes to between 0.2 and 0.3% per month increase because uh, the level has changed so much, it will take 12 months before the base the base effect begins to, the normalization of the base of the base effect takes, uh, take, begin, begins to take course. That's why uh, uh, our forecast is because of this, this momentum coming from uh, high, uh, high, high increase for the last uh, four, five, six months, then uh, it will take till uh, at the middle of next year because the, before the new base which is higher becomes the denominator and that's why we will see the lower year-on-year -year numbers uh, starting the second half of next year so it's just the simple arithmetic of it on the other hand uh, if you're looking at year-on-year -year, the the time where the uh, monthly headline numbers will start falling will be uh, either the last month of this quarter or the first or the second month of the last quarter okay so that tells you then that inflation in the for the full year the average inflation for the full year of this year will be 5.4 5.5 or even higher while the inflation for the first half of next year will be above four percent okay so it's only in the second half where we begin to see year-on-year -year numbers uh, going down to three or possibly lower than three and all of that combined means the inflation rate for next year will hopefully below be below four but much closer to four than three okay because the first half is above uh, above four and the second half is close to three and then uh, the average will be actually quite close to four and our calculation after we factor in the effect of our 50 basis points high class august is uh, the it's, there's more than a 50 percent chance that it will be below four mm -hmm. i cannot recall the exact numbers maybe the exact number is something like 55 to to 45. It's almost an even, but slightly sl slightly better than even chance that next year the inflation, the average inflation will be below uh, four, but much closer to four than three. Right. That, that forecast, Governor, when you said that you expect inflation to start to decelerate in the second half of 2023, and hopefully go back to within the central bank's target. Yes, will that yes. will that will that necessitate um, more rate hikes following the 175 basis points rate hike that the central bank has already undertaken so far this year? You have three more meetings this year: one in September and two more before the year ends. So to achieve that figure or forecast for next year, 
would that require more rate hikes, or do you think you've done enough and you can afford it? Okay. Yeah, that's a very nice question, uh, Karen. If uh, actually we had 100% uh, confidence in the forecast, that, then that means that no more rate hikes, right? Uh, but as I told you, it's uh, because uh, the way it looks, the midpoint of our forecast will be above, next year will be above four in the first half and closer to three than four in the second half. That means we have already gotten the path correctly. But uh, since there's no such thing as a sure thing, uh, the question is what is our loss function? we can end up uh, moving too much or moving too little which error is scarier right now i would say but, but so that's why this is really a a matter of preferences not just probabilities which is more scary uh, us or overshooting being uh, being surprised on the inflation side or us getting much lower growth rate than 6.5. Depending on the person, he may give one higher weight than the other. Personally, I would give the inflation much more weight. So, because I've been, uh, I, I guess 11 years in the monetary board changes your preferences. <laughs> okay, so, on the other hand, the most academic economist that I talk to says, okay, if it's 50-50, go for growth. So, uh, so actually, it, it, as I said, if, if, if only the midpoint of our forecast is the basis for decision, we're already on the right path. But I, uh, personally, I want a little bit more of comfort room. Room for comfort, not comfort room. <laughs> so that's a bad uh, <laughs> But maybe that's, that applies as well. <laughs> yes. Hmm. And so to yeah. achieve that comfort um, governor, that means... So depending, that on the, depending on your demand for comfort, you could be... Uh, for instance, I, I, I was just attending a... Uh, I will not mention which, uh, which bank. They asked me to be a, a keynote speaker. And the person, right be, the person who spoke right before me said, oh, the central bank will do 75 more before the end of the year. Okay, so I will not say whether my my preference function is above that, or on that, or below that. So the reason I won't say is that I, I don't want to make my colleagues feel that I am trying to pressure them to do what I like. That may work in the short run, but it spoils long run relationships. So, uh, so I would. Uh, so, in other words, uh, you can easily argue, depending on your preferences, using our forecasts, uh, uh, one, two, three uh, more increases. Or, or of course, uh, if, if I'm. I, I, you're very much more concerned about growth than, and you're taking, a, you're willing to take a 50 50 chance, you, you're con concerned about growth, then you probably say zero, right? So, again, the summary is it's, uh, it's now driven as much more by preferences than uh, by probabilities. So, uh, uh, and I, maybe I don't know if I'm the more the more hawkish member of the board or I'm just the midpoint. So, but, but taking off from from your statements, Governor, because you've been saying as well that the economy is strong enough to observe to absorb further rate hikes. So, on the one hand, you have uh, an economy that is on a solid footing, and on the other hand, you have, as you were saying a while ago, wanted to achieve that level of comfort and not just rely on that forecast of, yes, we might achieve that inflation settling in a midpoint. So again, go back to my question. So do you still see scope for more policy moves this year, maybe less aggressive than what you've done in the previous months? Or what's your, your, your 
take if, on that governor. If, if I were betting a month's salary, I would uh, say I, I will not rule out. I think zero increases requires a very lucky scenario. Okay, so I mean, a lot of really nice things have to happen. Uh, for instance, uh, very low oil. So, uh, and then uh, we are able to get our political acts together to temporarily reduce protectionism in a big part of agriculture as the sugar fiasco, uh, which is familiar, I, I know, as the sugar imports bill uh, debate. Okay, it's 300. No, it's 150. It low, it's zero. Yeah, so as you can see, the, so this is the problem. The, the, some of the non-fiscal solutions uh, are easy from the point of view of implementation, just a stroke of a pen. But the, the constituencies on both sides are, both sides are quite strong. And the status quo wins because the, the laws are written in favor of protectionism. So those are the things that uh, I look at. The, and then clearly uh, improvements in, in output due to better policies take a long time. So the, the only quick working part of the solution is temporarily be less protectionist. Hmm. So, but uh, that is it's easy to implement, but it's hard to get there decision-wise. Right. But having mentioned the issue of sugar, Governor, there seems to be a perception, but you already mentioned this while we were discussing about this uh, issue about importation. There seems to be a perception of the government's protectionist tendency, given the seeming reluctance to bring in more imports to immediately ease price pressures. Do you think that's misplaced at a time when we urgently need to boost domestic supply and pull price pressures? Yeah, I, I personally think that we should depoliticize importation decisions. Because if you make it political, then uh, it, it's very slow. Somebody has to get the numbers first. And as you know, the numbers come late. Right? Then the debates. So by the time, as we, as we, we say in Filipino, the horse is already dead when the, when the grass comes or the hay comes, right? So that's, that's the advantage, that's, that's, what, that's the lesson from the rice, the case of rice. Protectionism should be a debate on tariff levels, not a debate on uh, how much to import. Because how much to import will require estimates of supply, estimates of demand, estimates of shipping time, things that uh, uh, are hard to do very quickly. And by the time you are able to make the decision, um, uh, the, the, the firms that use sugar are already laying off or temporarily closing down as we can see. And the biggest loser is the government itself because uh, we're already taxing sugary drinks at a high level. So the loss here is not just a loss of consumers and jobs in the sugar using industries, but uh, a loss of revenue on the part of government. So that's why I think it's from, from a point of view of uh, just an economics teacher, it, it should be a slam dunk, right? But uh, then it's much more than that politically. But well, on the subject related to that, um, Governor, I think some economies in the region, for example, are are putting on the table um, plans to impose price control. Is that something that the economic managers are even looking at just to make sure that we keep inflation tame? Or is that out of the question? Well, it, it, it doesn't work. Suppose you succeed in uh, postponing the price increase. Then you just bottled it up. And then when it increases, it's a large one. Right? 
so it ratchets so uh, unless you the only time you do this you think this the shortage is temporary very temporary in other words by the time you let go of the controls the price is going down but that's an extremely uh, optimistic way of uh, looking at things the other one is it just creates corruption I remember in a Senate hearing I was listening to, I think it's uh, Senator Ontiveros. She said that uh, the right to import rice, the under the table value of that is so many, 500 pesos, 200, 300 pesos per sack. In other words, uh, the difference between Philippine prices and uh, exporting country price like Vietnam, Thailand, better be captured by government through a tariff than be captured by people close to the people who give the import licenses. No, very few countries in the world are able to, to make this uh, rationing system both clean and efficient. So, so this is very, very textbook. Uh, tariffs, uh, transfer the decision making to the people who are the most incentivized to make the right forecast the people who will import them and resell them right because you make the wrong forecast you're either you're sorry because the price go, went up and you failed to forecast it or you're sorry because you imported and the price has gone down so nothing like uh, nothing like the pocketbook to make you uh, the to, to, incent to incentivize you to be the best forecaster okay so that's why i i'm always for that i've been always for that on record that uh, all our protection should be uh, in the form of tariffs not in the term not in the form of quotas that are to be allocated and uh, our own history of uh, using quotas to allocate things has not been very good and in nearly all countries it's not been very good too many too many temptations and possible mistakes along the way right governor um let me just take a pause governor because i think we're getting questions from the audience uh just give me a second um just making sure i don't miss anything okay no. well governor related to the trade since we already talked about you know tariffs imports and exports a related question to that is we've seen uh net trade has widened and I think this is rekindled fears of, you know, higher twin deficits from a single imbalance to a twin imbalance. Do we need to moderate the imbalance, Governor? The Philippines has been posting large trade gaps in recent months, and the central bank is expecting a wider current account deficit, which implies additional mm -hmm. pressures on the peso. And you've discussed this ex extensively, Governor, in, in, you know, a lot of your, your, your um, recent uh, talks before business fora where you discussed as well how you know the 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 weakening of the peso could also be a big concern for the central central bank because of its impact in pushing prices higher and we've added in addition to that the expectations of further tightening by the fed for instance could further narrow the interest rate differentials between the us and the philippines and therefore piling pressure again on the currency so we've seen the central bank uh, do an off-cycle move in July in response to that. So, but what what is it? What's the scenario now, Governor? Is that still a big of a concern? Um, okay. Again, in relation to inflation and your your policy uh, outlook moving in, in the in the months to come. Uh, let me backtrack by looking at the changes in our forecast. Uh, well, uh, uh, changes in a uh, balance of payments. Like for 2022, we expect a overall balance of payments position of minus $6.3 billion or 1.5% of GDP compared to a $1.3 billion 
uh, or 0.3 percent of GDP surplus. Uh, okay, so that's a forecast. Now, what made uh, what what was, so it's a that's actually a what a a turnaround of almost eight billion dollars, right? Now, what's doing that? Uh, the first we 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 look at it. The biggest source of that is the increase in price of imports. So if we look at the uh, current account deficit, it was five or six billion last year. Our forecast th this year is twenty. Now uh, then we look further into it. We split that fifteen billion. In other words, uh, part of it was cancelled by FDI. That's why the and other portfolio flows and other uh, flows. That's why the the deficit is actually the, the the decline in the reserves will actually be lower than the change in the current account deficit. But as you can see, even with a relatively large uh, foreign direct investment, a a deficit in the balance of payments. Will, is also expected to materialize. Now, if the optimistic view is when the when the price is correct, which would happen, for instance, if there is a deficit, uh, if the U.S. has a hard landing, really, the, then many of these problems will temporarily be uh, solved. Meaning we go back to the situation that there is a current account deficit that's easily financed by investment flows. Now, uh, so maybe if, if with that view, maybe we can finance the, the selling of reserves could be uh, used to finance the, the deficit. Okay, because after all, six billion out of what ninety-eight billion. Uh, our uh, fall in reserves, we, we, we would still have more a, a comfortable, although not excessive, level of reserves. Because the question is, if this goes on forever, then it's not sustainable. Now, uh, so my view is, okay, uh, this year we can afford to watch and learn. But uh, because after all, uh, the, one error we don't want to make is uh, slow down the economy only to find out that there is no balance of payments deficit a problem uh, or uh, the other error you can make is it turns out this uh, this problem is more permanent and therefore maybe we should have made the correction early so from my, my point of view the risk this time is on the side of uh, well giving giving some room for growth and then uh, since there is there is quite a bit of buffer in the international reserves that's the nice thing about uh, being in the kind of position we're in if this was uh what 12 years 20 years ago when our reserves were what worth uh, two months of imports the the choice would have been clear the other way around Okay, so the the fact that uh, the central bank accumulated more than forty five billion dollars uh, of reserves under the tanko is what's giving us this uh, is what's giving us this uh, room to maneuver. But uh, you're right; if the if the carrot account deficit persists. Then sooner or later, uh, if, if, we, if we keep financing it uh, by setting our reserves, then uh, the, when the time comes, we have to make the adjustment. Uh, we, have, uh, we have less reserves to make the markets calmer when we are making the adjustment. The last thing you want is in a position where you're trying to make large adjustments in the balance of payments when you have no buffers. So, and then the markets will actually see the, what you, whatever you're doing is an act of desperation, which will add more to the problem. Okay, but fortunately, our, our, our uh, more than comfortable level of reserves gives us, buys us time for a wait and see. So we've also seen, uh, in relation to that, I was asking you about it, you know, it could also imply uh, additional pressure on the peso, which uh, hit 
um, a new record low today. So we have a question from the audience asking if you could comment on the pesos um, yeah. fall today and if you have an updated forecast on your exchange rate. And in relation to that, Governor, another question from the audience is they would like to know if you think that the recent fall in the peso merits further rate tightening as the Fed still sound hawkish, as we discussed a while ago. So yeah. and what can the central bank do to support the currency? Okay, let me first talk in general terms, you know, because sometimes a central banker does not want uh, to answer questions about the exchange rate uh, too clearly. Uh, the general principle is allowing exchange rate to adjust to a real fundamental problem of price changes of imports is a good thing. Uh, okay. The other one is if the problem is really a strong dollar rather than a weak peso, why are you making corrections? And in this particular, uh, uh, we change. If you change the reference point, if your reference point is the the day we hit the hit the market with a seventy five percent off cycle, the peso actually is one of the less this one the third or the fourth least uh, depreciated currency. So which means there 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 is no peso problem. It's a dollar problem. You know? So if, if that's the case, then uh, the, the, the response would usually be no, no reaction, right? So of course you can uh, put in other considerations that if, if the inflation rate were low, that would have been perfectly appropriate. But the, if the pro inflation rate is already high, do you want changes like it or not, all, most of your imports are dollar denominated. So that uh, changes in the exchange rate will add to the inflation. Okay. Uh, okay let's look at, at a hypothetical calculation. But also, these are numbers that already happened, right? So they're not going to happen again, I think. Uh, average price of our imports, let's say, have increased by 50%. And uh, the peso depreciated by uh, almost 10 percent that's 1.5 times 1.6 minus one right so so do you want do you want the do you want to add do you want to multiply 1.6 by 1.1 right so this is the this is why uh, during times like this with the already high depreciation of the peso and the Fed's actions making it weaken even further, one will say, well, you got no choice. You cannot, well, pardon my use of the double negative, you cannot not react. Okay? You cannot not react to what the Fed is doing. Now, whether, but I think though, it's wrong to react one for one. Because essentially, it's a U.S. inflation problem. Why are we importing their monetary policy 100%? So, it, it's, so there are two extremes, right? Not react. The other one is 100% react. I think the, the, the correct solution is uh, somewhere in between. between. But whether I'm talking about general principles, this doesn't, that, this doesn't predict that how we will react to the 70. If, if the 75 actually happens, what I was saying was hypothetical. That the 75 actually happens, will it be? Of course, if I, you follow the principles I'm using, it's not zero, and it's not uh, it's not 75, right? But then there are other considerations. That's the reason I I will not do the same trick all over again, right? Remember, I last time I said it's not zero, it's not 75. I'm I'm not saying that this time, and. Uh, they, all I can say in general is that I, I, we are concerned about the effects of the exchange rate. At this time, we are concerned about the effects of the exchange rate on the inflation. But like, right now, if one refers the exchange rate to what happened up the last time we compared to when the pr, compared to the time that we did the surprise 75, 
we are not the most depreciated. We are hardly the most depreciated country. In fact, we are, we are, my last look is we are, we are the second or the third least depreciated. So therefore, you can actually say it's a, it's, it's a dollar, it's a strong dollar, uh, not a weak peso. And uh, therefore, the reaction is purely trying to uh, improve our chances of getting inflation of below four next year. But, but to repeat the question from the audience here, because it's, it's connected to what you were discussing, we have a question whether you think the, the PESA's performance, as we saw today, merits a further rate tightening. Yeah, um, I, I say, what I'm saying is... Okay, I didn't say, I didn't say. Yeah. Go ahead, go. Go ahead. What I'm saying is, if your reference point is the... After we've done the 75 and the 50, it's not. Right? Because the, the most, actually, if you look at the, actually, I, I, if only my notes were not this clutter, I will, I will show you the chart, you know, that the, the Philippine peso is actually less depreciated using that, using that, uh, using the, using the exchange rate after we have done right after we have done both the 75 and the 25 so that would suggest we have done enough you've done enough yeah that 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 by itself not not counting other factors says we have done enough now what are the other factors if it turns out i don't think the math the market has already factored in a 75 fully factored in a full 75 with the Fed. So, so that was if the, if the Fed does much less, if the Fed doesn't do uh, 75, it looks like we've done enough because judging by the changes in the exchange rate, we are one of the least depreciated currencies after we've done the 75 plus the 50. But uh, but the, that would be a totally new story if if the Fed does uh, seventy five and uh, God forbid uh, then right, right after after that another seventy five. Okay, so those are those are the things that make it very hard uh, to make to be to to give forward guidance. It's very hard to give forward guidance when the future is so. It's hard to guide when you you yourself are having a hard time see, see looking forward and in particular the the what the fed will do is uh, is right now probably the the biggest source of uh, uh, uncertainty what will they do next because initially i thought that they would slow down already then uh, listening to chairman powell it seems to be uh, I had, had, had uh, concluded too soon, right? Right, so Things are just too flu. Things are just too fluid. Right. So, so the U.S. Fed, as you explained, Governor, is my understanding. It's going to be a big factor in your uh, when you when you meet on the twenty second of September, which yeah. actually follows the Fed meeting. I guess it will yes, depend uh, on what yes, they actually right. do, right? Yeah. Right. Yes, yes. So it's going to be a big factor uh, in your decision come September 22nd. So something that's yes. something to watch out for. All right, Governor. Yeah. The, the, and, and as you can see, the, the, what, the, what the other central banks do don't seem to matter too much, right? Uh, what Canada did or what uh, our... Or what Japan did, what the what the eurozone did, and uh, this is the sheer uh, import the great import centrality of the the U.S. dollar in the global uh, financial architecture. I guess that kind of answer my, my next question, Governor, because I wanted to ask your view on the ongoing volatility across emerging markets and then rising rates and capital outflow risks. So I guess. Is it correct that you see this as persisting yeah. and hence putting further pressure on emerging market currencies? 
Yes, and uh, I would like to say that the central banks that accumulated reserves during good times are in better position. Uh, Thailand, you notice Thailand has, not, has hardly moved. Of course, they also have a, they're also a more hard hit economy because of the, the blown tourism. I, I was uh, I, in an IMIAP meeting, I, I was uh, talking to the governor of the Bank of Thailand. They went from 40 million tourists per year to below 1 million. So the hit on their economy was uh, much harder. So they're therefore more, they're more concerned about GDP than we are. And second, they have a much larger uh, reserves. So they, on the, on, on the, using the output argument, they have a lower urgency to match the Fed. And using the reserves argument, they also have uh, lower urgency to match the Fed. So, so these are the situations. The Philippines, on the other hand, you're already hard hit by very, you know, we import food, we import fertilizer, we import fuel, you're already hard hit there. And uh, you do not have as much research as Thailand. And therefore, you are more likely to resort to the other instrument, the third instrument, which is the, the interest rate. But at the same time, you cannot say that no matter how high the policy rate is, we will be growing at 6%. And uh, and also, given that the, the instrument that we have takes a long time to work anyway. Uh, so in, to begin with, you have a very imperfect instrument for the problem. Okay, so, so that's the other thing that that makes a central banker like me uh, this time put a little bit more weight on growth gdp growth being too low of course if the growth rate were seven and a half i i i, I wouldn't mind that but uh, you know you're already bordering on uh, below six below uh, closer to five that's that's actually a major that's a major loss. Again, uh, you know, you, what, what does my what does my loss function look like? Okay. Our governor, uh, can we carry on uh, having some technical difficulties? Uh, but uh, let us continue with our uh, questions. I'm uh, Jerome Morales. Uh, good to see you again, Governor. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You too. Uh, Gover yes. Thank you. In terms of uh, the macro policy mix, uh, will the government's uh, fiscal stance, which is likely to become uh, expansionary be a reason for uh, BSP to hike, rate, hike rates uh, further, even if inflation starts coming down, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, second half of uh, 2023? Well, it's not really very, very expansionary to begin with. So, uh, so right now, uh, the, the fiscal is not our major concern. So the, you, you're not really seeing a very, in fact, I, I hear people complaining that, of course, everybody complains about uh, the budget, right? but I, I hear people complaining that, that there's not enough increases for a lot of good things. So, uh, and then uh, as a whole, the, 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 fiscal, the fiscal side is not, uh, all that stimulative and the best proof of that is the some some people like say my friend Romy Bernardo is actually uh, forecasting some something closer to 6.5 than to than to 7 okay so also uh, let's not assume that they can spend the money when they allot it Remember, there are there are spending lags. So that that's the other that's the other factor. One, one that's the other factor. The the biggest mistake that one can make is assume that because the budget is increased, all of it will be spent, and then comes the end of the year. They have, it's not it's not fully spent. So it you know, the the fiscal stimulus that you were reacting again against 
actually did not happen. Okay, so one has to be cautious in that in that regard. Governor, I would like to take uh, one question from the audience. This is since we're talking about the budget, and um, of course, we we the, the the president has proposed a record budget for twenty twenty three to support his uh, growth agenda. So the question from the audience is: What are the main drivers of growth that you expect to boost the Philippine economy over the next year? Okay, uh, actually, a big part of the infrastructure, the effect on growth has two parts. Carrot demand will increase. But its biggest effect is that it unclogs bottlenecks. So big increases in future capacity, right? So, so, so in other words, uh, we... Uh, second, uh, to the extent that uh, a big part of infrastructure is imported, the domestic demand effects is somewhat muted. But, so again, we're back to the exchange rate, right? Because the, the very high import content of uh, CAPEX. So all my comments regarding uh, managing uh, the exchange rate, uh, either, by, either by selling uh, our reserves or by raising policy rates, or letting the peso depreciate are the three three cornered option and usually it's wise for a central banker to keep people guessing which of the three he will use because the it, it, because the the, the 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 funds that will arbitrage us are, are could, could be quite large and i don't think it's a good idea to impose too many controls on capital flows. They do they do more harm than good. And with that, Governor, we would like to thank you so much for again spending time with us. It was a pleasure speaking to you, and I hope we speak to you soon. And we wish you all the best, Governor Medalla. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Anytime next time. Thank you, Governor. We'll watch out the September policy meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... I...